On this week's episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, Tesla finally announced the launch date for the Cybertruck. Plus, highlight clips and analysis from everything Elon Musk and the Tesla executive team had to say on this week's Q3 earnings call and more. What's happening, friends? I'm Ryan McCaffrey here with you for a very big, very exciting episode of Ride the Lightning, the Tesla unofficial podcast, which comes at you every Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific. It is episode 429 for October 22nd, 2023. I have decided to record this on Thursday evening because I worked really hard on Wednesday, the day of the earnings call, to get all my notes together, all my clips together. There were a couple of follow-ups today, which I'll tell you about in just a second. And I thought, you know what? The big story this week is the earnings call. And beyond that, it is the thing that you heard at the top, the thing you saw first in the headline, the Cybertruck launch date. I figure might as well just get this episode in the can get it out to my very kind and generous Patreon backers a little extra early and just capitalize on the energy that I have flowing through me this week. It has been super exciting on the back of this long anticipated milestone, the Cybertruck delivery event launch date. Uh, before I get to that, I've got a couple of quick things. First, a Cybertruck met a DeLorean last weekend, the first ever known meeting of the two stainless steel production cars. And I will tell you the entire story because yes, of course I was tangentially involved. I'll tell you that story towards the end of the show. Although speaking of the Cybertruck, before I move on, the subject of this week's Patreon poll calls back to last week's episode. Of course, I, I put up the poll before the earnings call. I usually put it up on Tuesdays as I did this time, so it was before we got that, that launch date announcement, but it was still Cybertruck related, and the question was simply, will you wrap your Cybertruck? Because of that news story I talked about last week, we now know that Tesla will be offering official wraps for the Cybertruck as they are about to now start doing for the three and the Y. So I simply wanted to know if that was something that you were interested in, and I gotta say, I'm a little surprised by how overwhelming the poll results were here. 74% of, of poll respondents said, no, I'll be sticking with the bare stainless steel. Uh, I would be voting right along with you. You've heard me say that a million times. I love the stainless. That is the entire reason that I am purchasing this truck. 17% of you said, I'm undecided for now, which of course is totally fair. You haven't even seen the truck in person yet. 7% of you said, yes, I'll go with a custom wrap. And 3% saying, yes, I'll go with one of the Tesla wraps we've already seen, such as the camouflage, the digital camouflage, or the Cybertruck graffiti across the side of the truck. A reminder, the Patreon poll goes up, as I said, every Tuesday at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. That's my Patreon page. And the poll does not require you to be a Patreon backer to vote. It is open to the public. Anybody can vote. So swing on by each and every week and cast your vote in whatever that week's question is. Another quick appetizer for you. Yes, the NACS Coalition Report segment is back. And it's back with not just one, but two new automotive groups jumping on board. First, the BMW family of vehicles was the first to join this past week, meaning BMW, Mini, and Rolls-Royce will all be supporting the NACS plug in North America on their North American vehicles starting in 2025 with adapters coming ahead of that next year. Now, as a side note, today, or this week, I guess I should say, I learned that BMW owns, owns Rolls-Royce. I never knew that. I guess if I had, it just went in one ear and out the other because apparently they've owned them when I looked it up for the past 20 years. It is not a new thing. Where have I been? But on a more serious note, the Mini Cooper E, which my wife considered very briefly, I, we found it to be overpriced and underranged. 
It just did not deliver nearly the range for the price that they were asking. I haven't checked up on it recently, but I can't imagine too much has changed there. But the Mini Cooper E with a with an NACS port could make for a really great small EV city car option once that built-in NACS port does go in, at least until Tesla gets the Generation 3 car into production, which we'll be hearing about more later on in the call when we get to the earnings call recap. And then the other one that signed on to the NACS coalition this week is Toyota slash Lexus, the Toyota group. Toyota, in my humble opinion, I've got no beef with them, but I would say that they've been dangerously on track to become the car industry's BlackBerry or Kodak, meaning a wildly successful company for decades and decades, but one that's unable to adapt to the paradigm shift in their industry, and so they get left behind and left for dead. That could still happen to Toyota, because, in, again, in my opinion, they still haven't really embraced electrification very seriously. They're even still talking like hydrogen is going to be a thing. It's not going to be a thing. Uh, and on top of that, their current EV, the one that they have right now on the market, the BZ4X, I've watched a few videos on it. It is an underwhelming car, to say the least. Again, all my opinion. I'm not rooting for them to fail, certainly. I think that them signing on to NACS shows that they're not completely oblivious to which way the wind is blowing in the car industry. And so hopefully this is the start of them getting way more serious about EVs. And if you're wondering, the tally for who's left, it's not many. There are not many major holdouts now. The Dodge Stellantis group, which includes Jeep, Dodge, of course, and a few others, Fiat, and the Volkswagen Group. Those are the two biggies. After that, you've got some smaller companies that are still holding out, like Mazda, Ferrari, who of course only makes a couple thousand cars a year, and as of yet, no EVs, although they are planning an, uh, a full EV. Aston Martin and Lucid, still not. Those are the, the, the holdouts that remain. Moving forward here, I hope all of you who are kindly backing me at that $10 a month tier on Patreon enjoyed this week's lightning round mini episode, which I confess, as of this recording, I haven't recorded yet, but I'm planning to do it right after this episode. And it is going to be about, or for most of you, it, it was about my personal rankings of all the Tesla events that I've been lucky enough to attend in person because the announcement of the Cybertruck launch event got me the delivery event, I should really specify there, so that's what it's officially called. That got me thinking about, oh, all the events I've been to, what have been the best ones? So I'm going to do an entire mini episode, and I do those mini episodes every week on Patreon. I'll do that uh, on that topic. And again, if you'd like to back me on Patreon, if you enjoy this podcast, you've been enjoying it for some time, then you can go to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. That is the place to sign up, join the Patreon. Uh, my hope is that at some point you will see it in your heart to go do that. And if you do, you get the early access to each week's episode, in this case, extra early access with this one. That's available to anybody at all the tiers because that's the base tier perk. And then you go to that $10 a month tier and you get the early access to each episode and the entire library of those weekly lightning round mini episodes. We're up to 67 of those now, so there's quite a bunch. So head on over to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast, Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Don't forget there's a free seven-day trial option on that most popular tier, that $10 a month tier, so you can check that out at no cost. All right. Let's start with the biggest story that you've been waiting for if you haven't already heard about this online. So before I walk you through the rest of the shareholder letter and the earnings call, Tesla tweeted this, quote, Cybertruck production remains on track for later this year with first delivery scheduled for November 30th at Giga, Texas. Yes, November 30th is the day. Now, interestingly enough, in the shareholder letter, it only says 
At Gigafactory Texas, we began pilot production of the Cybertruck, which remains on track for initial deliveries this year. So I imagine that the shareholder deck probably had to be locked down before they were ready to confirm the launch date. In any case though, this is amazing news. This is the thing that we've been waiting for for so long. I am so excited. It will have been almost four years to the day since the Cybertruck was first unveiled back on November 21st of 2019. I would also add, now this is, you know, this isn't exactly some grand insight. This is pretty obvious. This is also the most important Tesla event and the biggest Tesla event since that Cybertruck unveiling four years ago. And when I, when I was uh, walking Daisy last night and thinking about the everything else that has happened in between, it's not even close. We've had the semi launch event, which was pretty subdued. And obviously production on that has been respectfully barely production at all in the sense that they're only delivering to Pepsi. Pepsi's basically a paid beta tester. And so, you know, but okay, there was the semi launch event that they did live stream. So it was an event and Elon was there and gave a presentation. So it counts. There was AI Day 1, AI Day 2, we had Investor Day. Uh, Of course, the annual shareholder meetings happen every year. But they're really, and, and interestingly, the Model Y launch didn't get a delivery event. That is the only Tesla car so far that has not had a delivery event. And at first I thought, oh yeah, well it was COVID's fault because the Model Y started delivering right uh, at the start of the lockdown in March of 2020. But then I thought more about it and, and I realized, wait a second, no, I, I think the Model Y wasn't getting a delivery event anyway because the first deliveries of the Y actually started a, literally like a week before lockdown. I want to say, I should have looked this up. This is uh, just top of my head here. I want to say it was like March 15th, March, it was maybe 13th, 15th, somewhere in there. So it was right before the COVID lockdowns started, which of course shut down the Tesla factory in Fremont for a little while there for about five weeks. But yeah, the Y didn't get a delivery event. So the point is, this is by far the biggest event that Tesla's had since the unveiling of the Cybertruck. Although I do want to give a nod to the fact that in that time, in those four years, Tesla has broken ground, built, opened, and ramped up to full volume production on not one, but two new factories, Giga Texas and Giga Berlin, in that time, because as we've heard Elon say, and as has been clear, Tesla's focus really over these last four years hasn't been on vehicle reveals or vehicle launches, but instead their focus has really been solely on scaling up production as fast as they possibly could in order to meet the insane demand. And they absolutely achieved that. So they they launched two gigafactories, even if they didn't launch uh, any any other new vehicles with a with a proper event, you know the, the Y certainly. I don't want to overlook the Model Y. It's it's the biggest seller. It's the biggest money maker Tesla has, and it's going to be the number one selling car in the world this year. But yes, biggest Tesla event in four years coming up on November thirtieth. Also on this point, this might be the earliest that Tesla has ever announced an event date. It is once again on a Thursday, as usual, but this time they gave us six weeks notice instead of one week, which is greatly appreciated. Uh, My sincere hope is that I have the privilege and honor of being invited to the event as I was to the Cybertruck unveiling, because certainly, of course, I want to go for myself because I love Tesla and I have a Cybertruck reservation, but also, if I may humbly say so, I I very much want to go to represent all of you so that I can report on the experience, you know, man on the street, boots on the ground kind of thing, and report back to you of what it was like here on the podcast. So hopefully Tesla will will uh, get me my invite. Invites, at least as, this, as of this recording, have not gone out yet. And that is really the question. When will the invites go out? 
Is that not going to happen until a week ahead of time? Is it going to be sooner? Who knows? I hope they give a little longer lead time than one week to give people a chance to book flights. A little spoiler alert. I already booked a flight. I, I paid a little more to get the fully refundable, fully cancelable flight just in case. But I figured, you know what? The closer it gets, the more expensive the flights are going to get, the more they're going to book up because... I expect there are probably going to be a lot of people flying from the San Francisco Bay Area where Tesla engineering is and the Fremont factory is and, and a lot of Tesla owners are. A lot of people are probably going to be flying out from here out to Austin for it. So I went ahead and, and uh, preemptively booked a flight. But uh, so this is now the home stretch of the wait, or at least a weight. It's not the only weight because certainly the tougher part of the weight and still the longer weight is going to be, or at least the, the more emotionally difficult weight <laughs> is going to be once it does go into production and it's officially out as of November 30th, the weight for your specific Cybertruck once, once production begins. And now we're also left to wonder between now and November 30th, the big question that we've all been wondering for four years, or at least the better part of four years, ever since COVID kind of threw everything for a loop, what are the prices and specs of the final Cybertruck? So on November 30th, we are finally going to learn what this truck is capable of and how much it costs. We're going to learn whether or not there's going to be more than one variant available at launch. Are they going to offer that 500 mile range tri motor version right at launch? Will there will it be a tri motor that's not 500 miles of range and that one will come later? Will it be just dual motor, 300 something mile range? Still some big question marks. Again, as as you've been following along here in recent weeks, we know that Tesla has been testing the dual motor trucks because we got photographic evidence of that on a release candidate on a on a a uh, if not a, well, yeah, if not a release candidate, an engineering prototype, just to split the hair on that. So will it be just dual motor that starts production? Will it be tri-motor? What's the range going to be on either one? All of that will be answered in six weeks from now. Uh, because again, yes, we had prices and specs at the reveal event four years ago. But as I said, COVID and the subsequent global supply chain crisis that followed, it has cast some, some level of doubt on the pricing, and not to mention inflation, all, all that stuff's connected. It has cast some doubt on the pricing and the specs because four years is a longer time than Tesla thought. Things change. So, you know, what this, where this truck actually lands is uh, still a big question mark, and we all can't wait to find out. I do want to say, though, I want to say an, an honest congratulations to the entire Tesla team who has worked so hard to get to the point where they can lock in this launch date, this delivery event. I cannot imagine the countless hours that have gone into this at all levels of the company, every single level of the company. When, when you think about it, again, pull back that 10,000 foot view as I love to do from time to time. We are about to have the next big moment in not just Tesla history, but also, if I may be so bold, EV history. This is a from the ground up electric truck. No, it's not the first. Rivian got there first. If not, I don't actually remember if Rivian beat the F-150 Lightning to market. I think Rivian was first. Anyway, so they're not the, the Cybertruck's not the first, but it is arguably the, the boldest. It has the most pre-orders. It could end up being the highest volume. Uh, at 250000 a year is, is the plan, as you'll hear more about from Elon later in the podcast. But this is, uh, not to, to belabor the point, this is the next big moment in Tesla history, in Tesla's incredible story, and also EV history as well. And if you're keeping count at home, this will be Tesla's seventh vehicle launch. And if you're, wait, if you're going, wait a minute, seven? Don't forget about the original Roadster back in 2008 and more recently, the Semi, because I'm going to be totally honest with you. When I was first making my notes for this week's show, I wrote down six because 
I did forget about the semi. I was like, oh yeah, that's actually technically in production. That counts, even though we're not really seeing, most of us are not seeing them out on the road yet. There are only 70 or so of them in existence thus far. But in any case, it is officially Tesla's seventh vehicle launch in its 20 year history. As you heard a few months ago on this podcast, the 20th anniversary of Tesla as a company was, uh, was surpassed earlier in 2023. Four of those seven launches have come in the past six years. So uh, that is pretty significant, just to give you an idea of the acceleration and the growth of this company. Now, if you want to include major vehicle overhauls in this and count those as vehicle launches as well, because I think if you asked Elon or Franz, they probably would count those. You could make the case either way, but uh, then it, that, in that case, the Cybertruck will be their 10th vehicle launch when you add in the new Model S, the new Model X, and even though it's not available in North America yet, the new Model 3, which is now on car carriers in Europe, about to begin deliveries imminently to those who have placed orders in certain parts of Europe. For me, though, I'm just going to stick with the count being new vehicle launches. I'm not going to count the overhauls, the refreshes here. So lucky seven, Cybertruck is vehicle number seven for Tesla. Oh, by the way, one more thing before I get on to the Q3 shareholder letter and then the clips and analysis from the earnings call. Now that we have a date of November 30th, this should mean that the winner of the Cybertruck raffle sweepstakes from the loot box is going to get drawn pretty soon because that raffle sweepstakes promised one of the first Cybertrucks off the production line to the winner. So presumably the winner will be drawn at least a week ahead of time and notified so that they can make arrangements to come down to the delivery event and pick up their Cybertruck, presumably at the delivery event. And whoever that person is, they're going to be on cloud nine. They're going to be absolutely on cloud nine. I know I would be, I hope it's me. I mean, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers and toes. I would, uh, I would flip out. You'd, it would, might be the greatest episode of, of this podcast ever. If, if that happened and I just recorded my, my in the moment reaction to it. But in any case, whoever it is, is probably going to be taking delivery uh, along with that first group on November 30th. And I'll say this, whoever that person is, I would be willing to bet lunch that that person, should their name get out there, and I don't know, maybe there'll be an NDA and they'll have to kind of keep it all quiet, who knows, but if it were publicly known at the event, like that person's there and they're, they're telling everybody, yeah, I'm, I'm, I won the raffle, I'm getting my truck tonight, I would bet lunch that that person will get multiple six-figure offers to buy the truck right then and there, like right on the spot. And by six figures, I don't mean $100,000. I mean, I will bet lunch that somebody will offer them uh, between $150,000 to $200,000 at the event to buy the truck. And if it is me, I'm not taking that. I will, I'm taking the truck. We got to replace my wife's Mini Cooper. And for all I know, in, I mean, in all the joking, but also not at all joking and totally serious, whoever wins it might have to sign something from Tesla saying they won't flip it. Now, you could argue the merits of that either way, but, but that kind of thing has happened in the car industry before. If you're just Google John Cena Ford GT and, and you will find a whole story about that about that type of thing. But anyway, uh, if it's somebody that listens to this podcast that wins the, the raffle Cybertruck, please get in touch with me, whether it's email, Instagram, DM, Twitter, whatever it is, because I would love to interview you for the podcast. All right, let's get to the shareholder letter here and actually dive in. And then, of course, we'll get to the earnings call. First up is Tesla's overall summary, which I'm going to read you a little snippet of, not the whole thing. 
It's about as businesslike as it gets. Tesla opens their shareholder letter this quarter by saying, our main objectives remained unchanged in Q3 2023, reducing cost per vehicle, ca a free cash flow generation while maximizing delivery volumes, and continued investment in AI and other growth projects. Our cost of goods sold per vehicle decreased to $37,500 in Q3, while production cost at our new factories remained higher than our established factories, we have implemented necessary upgrades in Q3 to enable further unit cost reductions. We continue to believe that an industry leader needs to be a cost leader. During a high interest rate environment, we believe focusing on investments in R&D and capital expenditures for future growth while maintaining positive free cash flow is the right approach. Year to date, our free cash flow reached $2.3 billion, while our cash and investment positions continues to improve. The bottom line here, profit for Tesla in the third quarter was $1.9 billion. And cash in the bank, Tesla's, as I say every quarter, their Scrooge McDuck vault of cash is up to a whopping 26 0.1 billion dollars. Wow, that is insane. Next up from the shareholder letter, here are two what I found to be interesting pieces of the operational summary chart. They're down at the bottom. They're just kind of buried down there. But these are figures that matter to me as a Tesla owner, a Tesla customer, and I thought maybe they would matter to you too. So Tesla locations... Tesla opened 1,129 of them this past quarter, which was a 25% year-over-year increase. The, the uh, mobile service fleet, as I struggled to get those words out of my mouth for some reason, the mobile service fleet grew by 1,846 technicians this past quarter, a 20% year-over-year increase. Supercharger stations Tesla opened 5,595 of them this quarter, uh, which is a 31% year-over-year increase. With the individual supercharger connectors, the actual stalls, totaled 51,105 of them this past quarter. Again, a 31% year-over-year increase. And I have to say... I really like and appreciate that Tesla gives exact numbers for how many stores and service centers that they added each quarter, along with how many mobile service technicians they added, because I love the mobile service. I mean, who doesn't, right? They come to you. How much? It doesn't get any better than that if you've got to get your, your car serviced. And I also uh, like that Tesla gives the exact number of the supercharger stations and the exact number of individual stalls as well. I mean, as I've said a million times, my personal far and away biggest concern for Tesla as a company, as it continues to grow at an historic rate in the automotive industry, is that Tesla won't be able to keep up growth in service with the growth in vehicle production. Now, in fairness, I will say I don't have much context here to be able to make any kind of reasonable determination on that. But at least I can see exactly how much Tesla is expanding in the service side of the business each quarter. And hey, I'll say this, and just in a vacuum that I don't need context for, the numbers are bigger this quarter than last quarter, which themselves were bigger than the quarter before that, than the quarter before that. So they are, if you were to plot this stuff out on a graph, it would be trending in the upward direction which is what we want to see here. All right. Now, in the shareholder letter, we come to my favorite part of every shareholder letter, which is the installed annual vehicle capacity chart. As always, California, Model S and Model X, capacity, 100,000, status, production. Same thing in California for the 3 and the Y, with the same capacity as always, 550K, in Shanghai, the three and the Y, the capacity there greater than 950,000 per year. 
In Berlin, the Model Y capacity, 375,000 vehicles. In Texas, the Model Y, of course, production and the capacity there listed as greater than 250,000. And now we come to the Cybertruck, which is the big and welcome change, the celebratory moment, the, uh, the switch flipped on this. We have movement in the quarterly installed annual vehicle capacity chart. The Cybertruck flipping to pilot production for its status with a capacity, an annual capacity of greater than 125,000. Nevada, Tesla Semi, capacity not listed. It just lists a, a, a dash mark. And also, like the Cybertruck, lists pilot production. And then you have various regions, next-gen platform, again, dash, we don't, there's no capacity yet, status in development. And the one that bums me out every single quarter until the day when it finally gets a status update, but... Once again, for the umpteenth quarter in a row, the region is TBD, the model is Roadster, the capacity is a dash, and the status is in development. But yes, on the bright side, we have movement on the Cybertruck, which shows that pilot production, similar to the Tesla Semi, along with that aforementioned capacity at Giga Texas of 125,000 units per year. Now, Tesla probably won't hit that in the first year. Maybe they will. I hope they will. I mean, that would be about 31,500 cars per quarter on average. Although this, of course, will be an accelerating production curve and not a linear rate of quarterly production. But that capacity will go up when we get to year two, up to about a quarter million per when I asked Elon that very question back at Battery Day three years ago, and you will hear reiterated again in the earnings call coming up. Now, an update on the factories by region. In the United States, we have, of course, California, Nevada, and Texas. At Gigafactory Texas, we began pilot production of the Cybertruck, which remains on track for initial deliveries this year. Now we know it's November 30th. We are expecting the Model Y production rate in Texas to grow very gradually from its current level as we ramp additional supply chain needs in a cost-efficient manner. Production of our higher density 4680 cell is progressing as planned, and we continue building capacity for cathode production and lithium refining in the U.S. In China, which is of course Shanghai, where the factory is located, other than scheduled downtime in Q3, our Shanghai factory has been successfully running near full capacity for several quarters, and we do not expect a meaningful increase in weekly production rate. Giga Shanghai remains our main export hub. And then finally, Europe, and of course the specific region there, Berlin Brandenburg, Model Y remained the best-selling vehicle of any kind in Europe year to date, based on the latest available data as of August, similar to Texas, further production ramp of Model Y will be gradual. So to translate that, Berlin and Shanghai are 10 out of 10, no notes, perfectly smooth running ships at this point. Texas is still in a bit of an awkward teenager growth phase because of the Cybertruck and the 4680 battery cell ramps each of which are happening separately, but at exactly the same time in that particular building. So that is where we are with all of the factories. And that is everything I wanted to tell you about from the shareholder letter. But I'm going to cover the real fun of every quarterly earnings day, which is the earnings call, which I'll talk about in just a second. But first... I want to mention my friends at Accelerate Auto and their X-Care extended warranty policy. Once again, Ride the Lightning is brought to you in part by my old friends at Accelerate Auto who offer that excellent X-Care extended warranty coverage for your Tesla. They now offer battery and drivetrain coverage as an optional part of the plan if that is something that's of interest to you. 
They also do, they cover everything Tesla's own very limited extended warranty policy does. And when I say very limited, I mean, because of course it's only two years, only 25,000 miles of additional coverage with Tesla, and you have to buy it before your factory warranty is up. With Xcare, those limitations do not apply. Uh, you can buy at any time, grab that policy whenever you want, even if it's after the expiration of your factory warranty. You can also customize it to be up to 10 years, up to 125,000 miles. So head on over to accelerateauto.com slash xcare. That's X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E-A-U-T-O dot com slash X-C-A-R-E. And don't forget to use the discount code LIGHTNING for $100 off your purchase. Meanwhile, Ride the Lightning is also brought to you in part this week by Oracle NetSuite. Business owners, tell me if any of this sounds familiar. Your business gets to a certain size and the cracks start to emerge. Things that you used to do in a day are now taking a week. You've got too many manual processes. You don't have one source of truth. If that's you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and one. 36,000 is the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite's the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, that is NetSuite's age that they turned this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And one, because your business is one of a kind. So, you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins, everything you need, all in one place. So, right now you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash lightning. That's netsuite.com slash lightning to get your own KPI checklist, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com slash lightning. All right, here we go with the earnings call. As always, we start with Elon Musk's opening statement. You're going to want to listen to this whole thing. It is six minutes and 51 seconds long. So just a Q3 recap. Our last quarter was uh, impacted by downtime for global factory upgrades. Uh, that will help us reduce costs per vehicle as well as increase production. Uh, we remain focused on three main objectives, which is the cost reduction of our products, uh, investments in artificial intelligence, and other growth projects uh, like Optimus, and continued uh, free cash flow generation. Uh, regarding vehicle cost, uh, our team was able to reduce the cost per vehicle further in Q3, despite headwinds from factory idle costs and ramp up of new factories. And we believe there's still uh, meaningful room for improvement there. Um, regarding autopilot and AI, our vehicles now driven over half a billion miles with FSD beta, full self-driving beta, uh, and that number is growing rapidly. Uh, we recently completed um, a 10,000 uh, GPU cluster of H100s. We think probably bringing it into operation faster than anyone's ever bought brought uh, that much compute per unit time into production uh, since training is the fundamental limiting factor on progress with full self-driving and vehicle autonomy. Um, We're also seeing uh, significant promise with FSD version 12. This is the end-to-end AI where it's photon count in controls out. Uh, Or really, you can think of it as we, there's a, just a, a large bitstream coming in and a, and a tiny bitstream going out, uh, compressing reality into a, a very small set of outputs, uh, which is actually kind of how humans work. The vast majority of, of human data input is optics from our eyes. Uh, and so we are, like the car, photons in, controls out with neural nets, just neural nets in the middle. Um, it's very interesting to think about that. Uh, we will continue to invest significantly in AI development. Um, 
as this is really the the, the massive game changer. Um, and I mean, success in this regard in the long term, uh, I, I think, has the potential to make Tesla the most valuable company in the world by by far. Um, if you have or fully autonomous cars at scale and fully autonomous uh, humanoid robots that are truly useful, it's not clear what the limit is. <coughs> Regarding en energy storage, we deployed four gigawatt hours of energy of storage products in Q3. Uh, and uh, as this business is, grows, uh, the energy vision is becoming our highest margin uh, business. Uh, energy and service now contribute over half a billion dollars to quarterly profit. Uh, the Cybertruck, I know a lot of people are excited about the Cybertruck. Yeah, I am too. I've driven the car. It's an amazing product. Uh, I, I do want to emphasize that there will be uh, enormous challenges in, in reaching volume production with the Cybertruck um, and then in making the Cybertruck uh, cash flow positive. This is this is simply normal for when when you've got a, a product with a lot of new technology or any 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 new vehicle brand new vehicle program, but especially one that is as different and advanced as the Cybertruck, uh, you will have problems proportionate to how many new things you're trying to solve at scale. So I just want to emphasize that while I think this is potentially our best product ever. Uh, and I think it is our best product ever. Um, it is going to be require immense work to reach volume production and be cash flow positive at a price that people can afford. Um, often people do not understand what is truly hard. That's why I say prototypes are easy, production is hard. Uh, people think it's the idea or you make a prototype, you, you, you design a car, and it's not as though designing a car is is that so just anyone can do it. it? It does require taste. It does require effort to design a prototype. But the difficulty of going from a prototype to volume production uh, is like 10,000% harder to get to volume production than to make the prototype in the first place. And then it is even harder than that to reach positive cash flow. That is why there have not been uh, new car startups that have been successful. Uh, for 100 years, apart from Tesla. So, um, you know, I just want to temper expectations for Cybertruck. Um, it's a great product, but financially, it will take, I don't know, a year to 18 months before it is a significant positive cash flow contributor. Uh, I, I wish there was some way to that to be different, but that's uh, that's my best guess. Um, you know, so it, it, it really the, the demand is, is off, is off the charts. We have over a million people who have reserved the car, so it's not it's not a demand issue, but we have to make it, um, and we need to make it at a price that people can afford. Insanely difficult things. Uh, in conclusion. Uh, we continue to focus on uh, ramping production while maintaining uh, positive cash flow. And we continue to target, uh, expect to have around 1.8 million vehicle deliveries, uh, as stated earlier this year. Um, the Tesla AI team is, I think, one of the world's best. And I think it is actually by far the world's best when it comes to real world AI. Um, I'll say that again, Tesla has the best real-world AI team on Earth, period. Um, and it's getting better. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanted to thank uh, all of our employees who are making a lot of extra effort during uncertain times. Thank you very much for your hard work and the impact that you're making. Well, first of all, I believe that's the first time we've ever heard Elon or any other Tesla executive give any kind of firm number on the Cybertruck reservations. So over 1 million, which we all certainly expected, not a surprise there, but still incredible when you think about it. Also, it sounds like 
Elon's about to go back into, to use his term, production hell on the Cybertruck. I may be guilty of reading into this, although I was far from the only one to draw this conclusion, but it sounds to me like making the Cybertruck has been way, way more difficult than Tesla anticipated. And that's not a dig at them, to be clear. I think it's amazing that they've taken on this challenge, but the reason I say that is not just Elon's words and, and his somewhat somber tone there, which that got talked about a lot in the, in the certainly in the financial community. Everybody was kind of like, oh, why was he so bummed out? But the fact that Elon had said a while back during and after the original reveal that part of the reason it was going to be so affordable, remember, they had originally planned to make a 250-mile range single motor Cybertruck for $40,000 was because it would be a simpler overall production process, including the lack of need and thus cost to send any of the trucks to the paint shop due to the stainless steel. Plus, we know this truck uses the largest giga castings in the history of the car industry to speed up and simplify production, thus making it cheaper. So again, I'm not knocking Tesla here, far from it. It just sounds like manufacturing this truck in all the ways that they want to push it forward. I'm talking about the 48 volt architecture, the 4680 battery cells, these giant giga castings, the origami folded stainless steel is just proving to collectively be an incredibly challenging thing. But they're Tesla and they continue to get more and more awesome at manufacturing with each and every new product. So we all know they're going to get there. I presume when Elon says temper expectations, he's talking not just about the cash flow positivity of the Cybertruck, but also maybe the production volume as well. I hope I'm wrong on that and that he's really just kind of talking specifically to investors there about the CapEx on the Cybertruck and, and how that's going to take a while to make up. But I think it could be a production thing that he's hinting at there as well. It's, it's going to take some time to get to full production. Now, speaking of which, the first upvoted investor question that got asked was about exactly that. Specifically, the question was, how many Cybertruck deliveries does Tesla anticipate for 2024? It's difficult to make an accurate guess at this point. Um, going back to what I said earlier, that the ramp is going to be extremely difficult um, and uh, like, like I said, it's, there's, there's, there's no way around that. If, if you try to make, if, if we just try to do some copycat uh, vehicle design of which there are literally 200 models that are slight vari variations on a theme in the, in the combustion engine world, uh, just, a, just a, distinctions without a difference, uh, then, you know, it's really not that hard. But if you want to do something radical and innovative and, and something really special like the, the, like the Cybertruck, um, it is extremely difficult because there's nothing to copy. You have to invent not just the car, but the way to make the car. So the, the more uncharted the territory, the less predictable the outcome. Now, I can say that if you say, well, where will things end up? I think we'll end up with it roughly a quarter million cyber trucks a year. Um, and uh, but I, 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 we're not, I don't think we're going to reach that output rate next year. I, I think we we'll probably reach it sometime in 2025. That's my best guess. 250,000 per year would mean 5,000 cyber trucks per week because I believe Tesla runs the factory 50 weeks per year taking the Christmas week off as downtime and either the other Christmas slash New Year's week off, or maybe it's Thanksgiving. I'm not sure. Anyway, that 5,000 vehicle per week number has always been something of a magic number for Tesla. That is when they added the dual motor and performance variants into the mix for the Model 3. It's what they defined as success for the Model Y production ramps at both Giga Texas and Giga Berlin. And then if you go back to the 1 million plus reservations, if you ignore the fact, yes, fact, 
that many more reservations are gonna start to pour in once the Cybertruck actually hits the streets in December, officially. And then, on top of that, let's say, let's take a really generous attrition rate with reservation conversions and say that due to interest rates, due to the sheer amount of time that's gone by, that you, due to people with multiple reservations who only intend to go through with one of them, or whatever, that only about 50% of the million plus reservations are gonna convert to orders. If you take all that, which again, I'm being really generous here, you are still talking about production on the Cybertruck being completely sold out through roughly 2026 when you factor in the slow ramp up that's gonna happen uh, throughout 2024. That is wild. The next clip I have for you from the earnings call is one that gets upvoted every single time and I am happy for it to do so because it's always good to hear about this. Drew Baglino, what is the update on the 4680 battery cell production ramp? Uh, sure thing, Martin. <clears throat> um, 4680 cell production in Texas increased 40% quarter over quarter. Uh, congrats to the Texas team for producing their 20 million cell off of line one. Uh, Texas is now our primary 4680 facility. Um, we're heavily focused on quality. Scrap is down 40% quarter over quarter. Uh, with the increased volume and yield improvements, cell costs consistently improved month over month within the quarter, although we have a lot more work to do to achieve our steady state goals. And that is our priority. Um, the Cybertruck cell with 10% higher energy than our Model Y cell started production on line two in Texas. Uh, this quarter, we convert to building 100% Cybertruck cells to simplify and focus the factory as we ramp all four lines in phase one over the next three quarters. Phase two of the Texas 4680 facility is currently under construction. The additional four lines incorporate further capital efficiencies over phase one, and our target is for them to start producing in late 2024. Uh, lastly, in Cato, uh, we're retooling uh, to enable large-scale pallet runs of our next-generation cell designs. Cato's long-term goal is to be the launch pad for new cells, one generation ahead of our mass production facilities, enabling faster iteration and smoother ramp-ups of new designs. Well, after hearing that, anyone want to take a guess as to where the next-generation Roadster's cells are going to come from? If indeed they use 4680s in that car, which they might not. They might not necessarily. Could end up being 18650s like in the Plaid S and X. But... If it is 4680s, those Roadster cells are going to come from Cato Road, right down the street from where the Roadster is probably going to be built in Fremont. Or at the very least, Fremont is where Elon had once upon a time suggested that it would likely be built. I acknowledge that could certainly change since other factories have plenty of room to grow in them and Fremont is packed to the rafters. Uh, also, it makes a ton of sense that Giga Texas is now the primary 4680 cell manufacturing site, given that it sounds like the Cybertruck is going to get all of the 4680 cells for a while. Finally, the other point I want to make here, or I guess question I want to ask, is that the first time that we've heard that the Cybercell is 10% higher energy density than the 4680 cell that they were putting into that standard range all-wheel drive Model Y? I'm kind of asking for myself and just also asking aloud. My apologies if that was already out there, but it's not ringing a, ringing a bell for me, and I found it interesting. So a 10% improvement, which is not insignificant. That's impressive, because that means, theoretically, you could use 10% fewer cells, depending on how Tesla wants to play it, right? The next clip I have for you was about the a question about the capacity expansion plans for Berlin and for Austin and the update on Giga Mexico. Here's the answer. In Berlin and Austin factory, uh, the current priority is actually maximize the output from our existing lines uh, by laser focus on uh, efficiency improvement. As always, maintaining a high quality and reducing per unit cost will be as critical as growing the production volume. Um, for Mexico, uh, we're working on infrastructure and factory design in parallel with the engineering development of the new production that will be manufactured there. Um, that's all I can share for that. Yeah, in Mexico, we're, we're laying the groundwork to uh, 
begin construction um, and uh, doing, doing all the long lead items. Um, but I think we want to just get a sense for what the global economy is like before we go full tilt um, on the Mexico factory. Um, I'm worried about the high interest rate environment that we're in. Um, it's I just can't emphasize this enough that uh, for the vast majority of people buying a car is about the monthly payment. Uh, and as interest rates rise, the proportion of that monthly payment that is an interest increases naturally. So uh, that's if, if interest rates remain high or if they go even higher, uh, it's that much harder to for people to buy the car. They simply cannot afford it. Um, so, um, and, and we are tracking, I believe, at this point for Model Y to be the best selling car on earth, but not just in revenue, but in unit volume. If you compare that to the other vehicles that are, you know, number two and number three and whatnot, they they cost much less than our car. Uh, so, you know, we, we're just hit, hitting law of large numbers situations here. I know people want us to advertise, and we are advertising. Um, I think there is some there's something to that there is a something to be gained on the advertising front. I don't think it's nothing, um, but informing people of a car that is great that they cannot afford doesn't doesn't really help um so that that's that is really the thing that must be solved is to make the car affordable or you know the average person cannot buy it for any amount of money um or they or for, they simply can't afford it they can't afford it so this is a big deal well this is a bit of a plot twist Tesla is pumping the brakes on Giga Mexico. Berlin and Austin, as you will vividly recall, couldn't get built fast enough, which makes this something of a 180, or I guess at least a, a 90 degree pivot, right? But he's not wrong to have those macroeconomic concerns, which we will hear more from him about later in the call. Now, this also dovetails with the information that we learned from Walter Isaacson's new Elon Musk biography about how the Generation 3 car is going to now initially be produced in Texas, since that's where the engineers who are going to design it and work alongside the manufacturing team are going to prefer to live in Elon's estimation. This is all per the book. This is not me reporting this. That's what was in the book, but it does make some sense. Next up, what about Project Highland? How about the new Model 3? Yes, this was one of the most upvoted questions, as it well should have been. So kudos to everybody who upvoted this one. And well, take a listen. The next question is, when do you expect Model 3 Highland to be available in the U.S.? Um, I just wanted to address that, unfortunately, we don't answer product-related questions and timings on earnings call, so let's go to the next one. Well, with all due respect, they absolutely do answer product-related questions and discuss timings on pretty much every earnings call, but I get what Martin is saying here, the investor relations VP, if you're not familiar with who that was. They would be Osborning themselves by even addressing this question. Now, to their credit, they read it on the call at all, which I think a lot of companies would have just deleted that question, regardless of the number of upvotes that it had from shareholders, and just pretended that that question never happened. But if they were to say a word about the Highland, it would risk halting Model 3 sales in North America for you know some undetermined amount of time until the car actually arrives here. Now that said... Motor Trend, an American media outlet and a longtime friend, or at least you could say ally of Tesla in the media space, just this week did a Highland review. They did a first drive. They did a, a comparison to the old Model 3, which in order to do that, they would have had to have done that in conjunction with Tesla and with Tesla's blessing. So, Tesla's not turning a blind eye completely towards the existence of the new Model 3 in the U.S., but I do get why they have to throw up a brick wall about it in the context of the earnings call. It is on the way, probably in Q1 of next year, or in other words, roughly three to five months from now, 
We shall see. The next question, is the sustained 50% year-over-year growth achievable without any major vehicle launches in 2024? Thanks for the question. When we look at 2024, there are a lot of moving pieces. You know, I just talked about what is happening in the macroeconomic environment. So we're focused on growing our volumes in a very cost-efficient manner and are carefully reviewing all our options, and we'll be able to provide a much more meaningful update at our next earnings call. Yeah, and I mean, the risk of stating the obvious, um, it is not possible to have a compound growth rate of 50% forever, or you will exceed the mass of the known universe. Uh, so, but I, I think we will grow very rapidly and much faster than any other car company on earth by far. If you're curious, that first voice you heard was Tesla's new CFO. I'm going to do my best on his name here. I believe it's Vibhav Taneja. I hope I am close, at least respectfully close on that. I will get that over time. Uh, but it sounds like that they will speak to how they plan to make their 2024 growth happen on the next earnings call, which will not just be the Q4 earnings call, but the overall 2023 earnings call. Also, next earnings call will be the one where the Cybertruck finally is added into the production mix. So I wonder if Tesla will give that its own category. I think I've said this on the podcast before, but you know, the S and X are given, they're lumped together as one production line. The three and the Y are lumped together as another one. So is the Cybertruck going to get its own or are they going to try to lump it in with S and X? I could see them doing that if they don't want the exact number of Cybertrucks produced, especially in its first quarter, right? In in what's only going to amount to five weeks, if that, if that of production due to the aforementioned holiday downtime. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the next production and delivery report, which will happen, I mean, we'll get that on like January 2nd or so, give or take a day, that if they, I wouldn't be surprised if they end up lumping in the Cybertruck with S and X. Anyway, uh, so yes, the next earnings call will be not just the Q4 earnings call, but the overall 2023 earnings call. And funny enough, Elon's half-joking response to their growth rate kind of contradicts the company's own shareholder letter, which did reaffirm 50% growth year over year. Not that I disagree with Elon there, to be clear, they will certainly grow more quickly than any of their competitors in the automotive industry. I have zero doubt about that. The next question was about the timeline on the robo taxi. Well, the robo taxi is like necessarily non-driven. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I guess I'm I'm very excited about our progress with autonomy. Um, the end-to-end, nothing but nets, uh, self-driving software is amazing. Um, I, I drives me all around Austin with no interventions. Um, so, you know, this is clearly the, the right move. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, I know, it's, it's really really pretty amazing um and also that, that same software and approach will uh, enable optimus to do useful things uh, and and enable optimus to to learn how to do things simply by looking um, so you know, extremely exciting in the long term uh, as I as I mentioned before, you know, given that uh, economic output is number of people times productivity, if you no longer have a constraint on on people, effectively you've got a humanoid robot that can do as much as you'd like. Your 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 economy is quasi infinite, or you know, infinite for all intents and purposes. Um, so and I don't think anyone's going to do it better than Tesla, not by a long shot. If 
bus dynamics is impressive, but their robot lacks a brain. Sort of like the Wizard of Oz order. It's immense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lacks a brain. Um, and, and then uh, you also need to be able to design the humanoid robot in a w such a way that it can be mass manufactured. Um, and then at some point, the robots will manufacture the robots. Uh, now, obviously, we need to be, make sure that you know, there's a good place for humans in that future, and we do not create some variant of the Terminator <laughs> outcome. Um, so we're going to put a lot of effort into localized control of the humanoid robot. So you, you know, basically anyone will be able to shut it off locally, um, and you can't change that. Uh, even if you, you put like a software update, you can't change that. It has to be hard coded. Well, that answer pivoted from the robo taxi over to Optimus rather quickly, didn't it? I think Elon might be purposely trying to not talk about the Generation Three car wherever possible, since it's still probably pretty far away. And, you know, I can't blame him for that. You need customers to buy the cars that you're making right now. I mean, he did throw in a little shot at Boston Dynamics there. That was a bit out of left field. It's a funny joke, though. I'll give him that. Uh, next up, this was a great investor question that got asked, and uh, it was interesting to hear the response, as you'll hear in a second. What's with the price drop on FSD? Well, we just wanted to make it more affordable. Uh, some more people could try it. Uh, yeah, I, I think over time, the price of FSD will increase proportionate to its value. Uh, so I would regard the current price as a kind of a temporary low. Correcting myself real quick, that was one of the upvoted retail investor questions, not an analyst question. We're going to get to those in just a second. But anyway, I know I'm probably inventing a story that isn't real here. But based on how short and, if I may, unenthusiastic that answer from Elon was, my guess would be that Elon was convinced by his team to lower the price of FSD because clearly the take rate on it was getting lower than what they were comfortable with, and he reluctantly went along with a price drop after being shown the numbers on that. So I could easily be inventing that, but... That's something that could easily be plausible in my mind. I suppose the real question we need to ask ourselves, though, is how long is it going to stay at $12,000? The second question we have to ask ourselves is, do we think it will go any lower than $12,000? And that one, as much as I would love to say yes to it, given Elon's repeated previous public statements about how FSD is a bargain and, the, and it's going to continue to to get better and get more expensive. I just can't imagine it's going to go lower than where it is now at 12k. But to the first question, it's hard to say. I suppose it's likely to stay where it's at at least until version 12 is not only out but smoothed out, meaning version 12.1, version 12.2, something like that. We shall see. On the subject of full self-driving, the final retail investor upvoted question that I wanted to play the answer to for you was asking about what's going on with full self-driving outside of the United States. Yeah, our approach has been to try to get it, to, like the more places we try to make it work, the harder the problem is. Um, so the reason we don't do it in all countries simultaneously is that it would take much longer to, get, to make it work anywhere at all. Uh, so um, that's why it's currently just uh, North America. Uh, and, and also for most parts of the world, you have to get approval before deploying things. Whereas uh, in the U.S., uh, you can deploy things at risk or at least you can take liability for what you deploy. So um, it's uh, – whereas most countries require some sort of extensive appro approval program. Um, so we, all, we only want to go through that extensive approval program when we think it's kind of ready for prime time in that country. I apologize that it's not, not in those countries, but we, we keep finding ways to make it better. And uh, it, 
it really would, it needs to drive drive it needs to drive such that it exceeds the even unsupervised significantly exceeds the probability of injury of a human or significantly better you know, a lower probability of injury than, than a human by far um, I think we're, we're, we're tracking to that point very quickly um, obviously in the past I've been overly optimistic about this um, the reason I've been overly optimistic is that the progress tends to sort of look like a log a log curve uh, which is that you have kind of rapid initial improve, improvements and that if you were to extrapolate that sort of rapid, fairly linear rate of improvement, you, you, you get to self-driving quite quickly, but then the, the, the rate of improvement curves over logarithmically um, and starts to asymptote. That's now happened several times. I would characterize our progress in real-world AI as a, a series of stacked log curves. Um, I think that is also true in other parts of AI, like LLMs and whatnot, a series of stacked log curves. Um, you know, each, each log curve gets higher than the last one. So if you keep stacking them, if you keep stacking logs, eventually you get to FSD. I would have to imagine that the FSD take rate in Europe specifically is near zero, right? And I can't blame anybody for that. When you know that regulators are a significant gatekeeper and that, as Elon just made it clear, you're not going to get it until it's totally ready to go. And then even at that point, it has to go through the regulatory approval process. Why would you pay for it? I mean, I think that's a, a question that a lot of European Tesla owners, including a number, of, there's plenty of European listeners here that you've asked yourselves. But anyway, FSD version 12, that's going to be really fascinating to see in terms of noticeable improvements to us, the lay people, the non-engineers who are driving these cars and using the software. Elon has talked up version 12 quite a bit over the months. So hopefully this is going to be the one that will get them onto the doorstep of being able to take it to the regulators in non-American countries. I move now to the analyst questions. Let me see here. I've got just two that I wanted to flag there. The first one was about the Generation 3 car and its production ramp. Will the Generation 3 car's production ramp be as slow as the Cybertruck's ramp? Will it take in the, in the analyst's uh, words, three years, which is what he said. And that factors, I, I, I set that up because of Elon's response. Take a listen. Yeah, I, I mean, to be clear, it's, it's it's not really the third year of production. It's kind of like the 18th month of production is roughly uh, my guess. So it's just that they happen to, it'll happen, is that the, it starts this year, spans next year, and gets to 2025. So technically, there are three calendar years in there, but there's actually only 18, 18 months, not three years. I would be very disappointed if it took us, and that, that, would, that would be shocking if it took us three years. Mm -hmm. um, but 18 months from initial deliveries um, to have to reach volume and, and reach prosperity with an immense, I, I can't tell you how much the blood, sweat, and tears level required to achieve that is just Staggering. I've been through it many times. And then here, here we go again. Um, you know. Um, similar path for the next gen platform? I mean, there's like unique complexity to cyber. Yeah. 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 I mean, cyber truck is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, we dug our own grave with cyber, cyber truck. You know, <laughs> nobody, you know, like, in general, I probably, you know, nobody dig, digs our grave better than themselves. And so, <laughs> uh, I. I <laughs> You know, it it is it is um, you know Cybertruck is one of those one of those special pro products that comes along only once in a long while, um, and and special products that come along once in a long while are just incredibly difficult to bring to market to reach volume to to be prosperous. Um, it's it's fundamental to the nature of the the newness. Um, so now the sort of high volume, low cost, uh, 
smaller vehicle is actually much more conventional. Uh, it's, yeah, in terms of like the technologies we're putting into it, we didn't have to invent how to bend full hard stainless steel or have mega 9,000 ton castings or the largest hot stamping in the world or new yeah. high voltage, low voltage architectures. It's 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 learning from everything we've done. So it, we hope it will ramp faster than the, the you know the technology. Uh, we also went through like a ruthless simplification exercise. Yeah, we did. So. <laughs> There's significantly less parts and. Yeah, you're only as fast as the slowest part. If you have less, less of those, that means you could probably be faster. Yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, that said, it's you know, it's still still pretty revolutionary in how we're going to build it. It is. Um, yes, it's it's a the manufacturing approach for the, the high volume small vehicle is. Uh, Revolutionary, um, but not revolutionary quite in the same way as the Cybertruck. I, I, I think it will be quite a fast ramp. Um, so, it, as Laz was saying, we're, we're doing everything possible to simplify that vehicle in order to achieve a um, units per minute level that uh, is unheard of in the auto industry. Yeah, I mean, the simplification makes it easier to automate. It also makes it lower cost. Yeah, but it's the, the intrinsically lower cost. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be clear: is it'll be cool, but it's it's utilitarian. Um, it's not meant to be, you know, fill you with, you know, all and magic. It's uh, it can get you from A to B. And it'll be so beautiful, but. It's a it's utilitarian. It's, it's a utility. Doesn't have fourteen inches of travel on its suspension. <laughs> yeah, as an example. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the Cybertruck has a lot of bells and whistles. We heard from Elon, and we heard from Lars Moravi there as well. This is hardly the first time that we've heard Elon talk up the Cybertruck, of course. But the new detail on the Generation Three car that was the real juicy part of that clip. They said it'll be good looking, but reading between the lines, pretty bare bones. Elon twice said that it's utilitarian and meant to get you from point A to point B, which makes sense at that price point, right? That answer, I think, also lends a bit of credibility to my theory from some episode in recent months where I thought, I said that I thought that there wouldn't even be a performance version of the Generation 3 car. In fact, I said at the time, and now I'm, I'm willing to kind of double down on it after hearing Elon's comment there, I'm not sure there will even be multiple variants at all of the Generation 3 car, meaning no long range, no standard range, just the car. Just a 250 or so mile range car same battery, same single motor drivetrain in every Generation 3 car that they build. And the revolution, uh, pardon me, revolutionary manufacturing approach that we heard Drew, Drew Baglino talk about there, that is the packing technique that Tesla described at Investor Day, where in short, they will build the car around the interior rather than having to put the car together, then take the doors off, then put the seats in, and they want to simplify that entire process. All right, let's move along here to the final clip. What of the recent reports, this actually isn't the analyst's question, but he crowbarred it into the middle. So what of the recent reports that Tesla is offering cars in China with an optional radar? That was something that bubbled up this week. I obviously didn't cover it earlier in the podcast, I figured it would just organically fit in here, but that there were reports of that that had, that had popped up. So here's Elon speaking to that. And if I can sneak one in, please. There are press reports, uh, and I know how perilous it is to believe some of these, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, they, they say that you've included radar as an option in some model Ys in China, and I'm just here to ask if that's true, and if so, why? Thank you. Uh, we've not included radar. Uh, we, we, we have radar as a, a Tesla designed radar as an experiment in the Model S and X. 
Uh, that's it. Uh, we'll see whether that experiment is worth it. Um, but there are no plans to, to integrate radar into 3 and Y. Um, you know, just as humans drive well, and in fact, an, an excellent human, human driver can drive with, with amazing safety simply with uh, their eyes. Um, the, the car will, will far exceed uh, the average human safety just with vision. Far, far, far. Um, because, I mean, the car is looking at all directions at once, and we don't have eyes in the back of our head. So, and, and it, the computer never gets tired and never gets distracted, get drunk, hopefully. Uh, um, and um, so, r r radar is, uh, you know, it, it's not, it, it, what really matters is how much does it affect the probability of an accident? And in order for the radar to be effective, you have to be able to do radar only braking. You have to do actions that are that are ra radar only. Otherwise, you get this disambiguation problem between vision and radar. Um, that's why we actually turned off the radar in cars historically that we had shipped. It. All three and Y used to have radar, but we turned it off because the radar actually generated more noise than signal. Um, now, the Tesla designed radar is a high resolution radar that has some potential to be useful. Um, but the jury is, is still very much out on, on whether that is in fact the case. It's funny because I was just talking about this last week when I read you the excerpt from the Isaacson biography on this very topic. I wondered at the time last week where Tesla stood with this, and it sounds like they still haven't made any decision with regard to the HD Phoenix radar in the S and the X. I do find this interesting in that Tesla is so obsessed with deleting parts and lowering costs in every car that I imagine they must be getting some kind of useful data from the new S's and X's and their HD radar that they've been pulling over these past two years since those cars have been on the market, or else they would have probably already pulled the plug and eliminated that in-house developed Phoenix HD radar unit. I mean, I... This is one of those times where I wish I could have been on the call and able to actually ask a follow-up question because I wanted to know, like, does Tesla have the data that it needs from the Phoenix radar? And if and when they do, what happens if that data shows that the Phoenix HD radar is in fact really beneficial to safety? What happens at that point? Because you'll have millions, actual millions of threes and whys on the road that don't have the HD radar. And so what do you do? Do you just offer it on the S, X, and Cybertruck and, and kind of keep it to the premium vehicles as like an added safety thing or what? I, I'm just kind of curious what the end game is for Tesla based on when they feel like, you know, what the, what the situation is going to be when they feel like they've got the data that they're looking for. Anyway, uh, also, actually, I guess there's one other question that I would have. I would, I'd have two follow-ups. It would be that, and then, is that Phoenix HD radar active in the S's and X's for those of you that own the new S and X right now? Is it actively benefiting you in your cars right now? Or... Is it just collecting data in the background in shadow mode? I honestly don't know. I would like to know the answer to that. So I still have big unanswered questions about this, but it was good to hear a bit about their thought process on it from Elon right there. All right, that is the end of the earnings call, the shareholder letter, the big Cybertruck date announcement that happened on Twitter of all places rather than in the earnings call or shareholder letter itself. It was a wild week this week, a very exciting week. The stock market certainly didn't think so. Uh, here on Thursday, the day, of course, after the earnings call, Tesla stock was down $22, which I guess is what, I don't have the percentage in front of me. It's roughly, that was what, roughly 10%, I think. But anyway, stock market wasn't a fan, but the Cybertruck date alone is enough to have me floating on cloud nine right now as I record the podcast this week. I'm super fired up for it. Now, 
I do definitely do not have time this week, as is typically the case with the earnings call episodes of this podcast. I don't have time for, for your calls in the Ride the Lightning hotline, but I've got a ton of great ones queued up, ready to go for next week's show. And if you would like to call in and comment on something, maybe some point I raised, some question I raised, some thought that you had after hearing the clips from the earnings call or something that I said, and you'd like to call in and potentially be featured here on Ride the Lightning in a future episode on the Ride the Lightning hotline, you can call in in one of two easy ways. Either use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your question, please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less so that I can get to as many callers each week as possible, and then email that file to me at my Tesla podcast email address, which is teslapodcast at gmail.com, or you can call in and leave a message on the Ride the Lightning hotline. It's a toll-free number that you're welcome to dial anytime, and that number is 1-888-989-8752. Again, that's 1-888-989-TSLA, and I will be right back with your pro tip of the week and the story that I promised at the top of the show about the first ever meeting of the DeLorean and the Cybertruck. Stay tuned right after this. Hi, this is Franz von Holzhausen, and you're listening to Ride the Lightning with Ryan McCaffrey, the Tesla unofficial podcast. Well, it was bound to happen eventually, and it managed to happen before the Cybertruck officially even launched. And that inevitable thing was a meeting of the only two production stainless steel vehicles in history. I know you can put an asterisk on it because technically the Cybertruck or at least it wasn't in production as of last week, but I think you can we can let this one slide. So, yes, a Cybertruck met a DeLorean uh, last weekend, and that DeLorean happened to belong to my friend Christian, who texted me the pictures. Just unprompted, he, he, just, he just popped the pictures over to me on text, and I was like, I was like, is this your DeLorean? Did you find this? And sure enough, so the, the quick story is he spotted so on reddit they're on the cybertruck subreddit which i frequent because it's fun and it's part of my job here on ride the lightning there are basically any time anybody sees one they'll take a picture of it a video of it and post it up on the cybertruck reddit and certainly it's it's at the point where some of the users on there are like okay there's no more value in this can we please stop posting these but this this time uh somebody po- just posted one parked in San Francisco at a recognizable enough spot. In fact, my friend Christian, DeLorean owner friend, recognized it. And so he saw it on Reddit, like as soon as it was posted, got in his DeLorean and zipped over. The Cybertruck was still there because presumably this is a take-home test, a a take-home sample, take-home truck for one of the engineers, which as we know has been happening lately. And so he parked his DeLorean right next to the Cybertruck, took a bunch of pictures, took a little walk around video. He sent me the pictures and gave me the permission to post it on my Twitter or X and and as well as my Instagram as well. So I, I didn't just steal the pictures. He gave me the permission. He sent them to me directly and said, yeah, go ahead and post them up because he knew my audience would be super interested. So if you'd like to see them, they are on my Twitter and Instagram, it's probably quicker to find them on Instagram because Twitter, you know, they're they're buried way down uh, by the time you'll hear this. But my handle on either Twitter or Instagram is DMC underscore Ryan, uh, if you'd like to jump on there and check those out. But it, it really was cool to see them next to each other. Now, in fairness to the Cybertruck, this is a, you know, if not hand-built engineering prototype it's a release i mean it did say R- it had the rc label on the side so okay release candidate but it's not a production truck the fit and finish isn't being focused on it's so this one looked cleaner than the the pretty rough one that i found in the trader joe's parking lot a couple weeks ago but still you know it was definitely not a perfect truck by in terms of the panel gaps and it was all, it wasn't clean. It was covered in handprints and all kinds of stuff. So it wasn't like this beautiful glamor shot that will happen. Like that is, that'll happen pretty soon, you know, with, 
whether you know, with somebody that takes one of the delivery of one of the first production cyber trucks they'll probably end up connecting with a with a DeLorean owner or a local DeLorean club or something but so I'm just trying to trying to caveat this a little bit that it wasn't like a beauty shot photo shoot kind of thing but it was still really cool to see them side by side uh, the DeLorean looks tiny compared to the giant full-size cyber truck but it's neat to see they're the stainless steel, like, you know, the DeLorean's got the brushed stainless steel finish and the Cybertruck does not have the brushing. So, you know, it's a little more mirror, mirror effect looking. It's a little kind of more reflective and shinier than the DeLorean. Um, but just seeing, just seeing them side by side is such a cool, I mean, honestly, I, this is going to sound hyperbolic, but it's a, it's a significant moment in automotive history, right? It's a little moment to be sure. It's a little moment, but it is significant. It's the only two production stainless steel bodied vehicles in the history of the, of the automobile in the last hundred and whatever it is, 125 years, whatever it is. The first time that the, that the two of them have been side by side together. So that was really cool to see. And uh, again, shout out to my friend Christian. I've known him pretty much since I moved to the Bay Area 20 years ago with my DeLorean and joined the local club, and and he was a part of that. Um, he had actually since sold his DeLorean and now has bought another one. So he's got a, a beautiful 1982 DeLorean now, which mine was an 82 as well. But very cool to see them. It just made me really happy. It's put a big smile on my face. And so feel free to cruise on over to my Instagram if you'd like to see them well, uh, see them as well. And I will give give Christian a shout out too. I don't know if he's looking for followers, but his Instagram is Blade Bronson, all one word, just to just to give him proper credit there. All right, time for your pro tip of the week. It's from Mel in North Carolina. Hi Ryan, this is uh, Mel from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, calling in with a pro tip of the week, a uh, little bit of story here. I just traded in my 2019 uh, Model 3 for uh, with full self-driving for a new 2023 uh, Model Y. And as I was putting in the uh, Tasmanian nine-piece waterproof uh, floor matting system, I had to pull forward uh, the seats uh, in, in the back to install uh, those devices. So as I pulled the seat lever to allow the seats going uh, to go forward, I noticed that there was a small uh, gap about six inches between the back of the seat and the, uh, I guess the, the, the piece that goes uh, over the back trunk. So it made me think, hmm, I wonder if this seat leans back. And sure enough, if you pull the lever and hold the chair so it does not go forward and you just simply push it backwards, it allows the back seats to recline for about three, maybe four inches. So that was actually um, pretty amazing when I saw that. Uh, and so I thought that was a pretty good pro tip of the week. Uh, and just a caveat to include, I'm sure most people are aware that there are the two buttons in the back trunk area as well, that if you press those, those allow the seats to go forward as well. But the pro, pro tip of the week is for the back seats that recline. I had no clue. Amazing. Uh, it's anyway, it's just amazing. So uh, that was that was it. And thank you very much. Bye. Mel, thank you very much. This is one of those wonderful things that's not super obvious when you get your Model Y. Now, in fairness to Tesla, I did just double check the design studio and it does actually list it there. It says second row with adjustable seat backs, but you and anyone else would be very much forgiven for glossing over it, both when you're ordering and when you're taking delivery because, well, you're super excited when you're ordering your car and more excited when you're taking delivery of it. So it sounds like you are very much enjoying your Model Y, Mel, and I appreciate you calling in with that pro tip. And if anybody else has a pro tip of the week that you'd like to share with me and your fellow Tesla owners and enthusiasts, please send it my way. 
you can do so by calling in the same way that you call into the regular Ride the Lightning hotline, the instructions for which I gave you just a few minutes ago. All right, before I get out of here, let me mention some friends of Ride the Lightning that hopefully sooner or later will be of use to you. I start as usual with abstractocean.com. They make so many excellent aftermarket Tesla accessories, lighting kits, both interior and exterior and in different colors, the tempered glass screen protectors that are now on their fourth generation. They use Gorilla Glass, that aluminosilicate glass that has the antimicrobial coating. It's like, it's the good stuff. It's what, it's what Corning uses for Gorilla Glass. So they've got that. They've got just all sorts of great little accessories. I encourage you to just take a look on abstractocean.com, click on whichever Tesla you own, check everything out, pile everything you like into your online shopping cart, and then when you get to checkout, use the coupon code RTLPODCAST and you will get 15% off of your first order. That's again, RTL Podcast, all one word, no spaces on that coupon code. The Snap Plate and the Snap Plate Plus, both available at everyamp.com slash RTL. And on top of that, when you get to that URL and you're going to buy a Snap Plate or Snap Plate Plus, use the coupon code RTL for a nice little discount. The Snap Plate and Snap Plate uh, Plus, but it's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? A little, a little, a little alliteration going on there. Uh, but anyway, they are very good products. These are created by former nuclear power plant engineers, and they say safety and conservatism is ingrained in us. So we've designed the Snap Plate to be the safe option that we wanted for our personal vehicles. That's referring to the Snap Plate, but. They say, we've learned over the last four years that different people have different priorities and many customers just want things to be as strong as possible. So the Snap Plate Plus is designed to give those customers the strongest possible mount. Either way, they are a nice minimalist design if you either want or legally need to have a front license plate on your car. They're both made from recycled, made in the USA plastics with stainless steel reinforcements. Get yours at everyamp.com slash RTL and use the coupon code RTL. Meanwhile, if you are considering solar for your home or business, check out budgetsafesolar.com as one of the options that you will no doubt shop. It's a big decision. You will probably scope out a number of solar providers, including Tesla, certainly. But if, uh, if it works out with Budget Safe Solar, well, they worked out well for me. We've got a nice system on our roof. Uh, we've got the highest efficiency panels we could get because we don't have a lot of real estate up on that roof. So I'm pretty happy with how the whole thing went. If you end up going with them, again, visit them at budgetsafesolar.com. They do also now offer home battery storage as well as just the solar panels. So that's uh, you can get the whole kit and caboodle there. Men make sure, I should say, to use the referral code RTL if you do indeed proceed with an installation. Immaculate Reflections, their website is irdetailing.com. If you and your car are in or going to be in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, there is no finer treat for your car than taking it to Immaculate Reflections. Maybe you wanna get the paint correction, just get that paint finish looking better than factory new. Take all those little swirls, little imperfections out. Maybe you want to do paint protection film on some of the car or all of the car. Maybe you want to do ceramic coating, which is, of course, the latest generation version of, of wax, basically. You get your car ceramic coated, and you won't have to wax it for the next three to five years because that's how long ceramic coating lasts, and it's just the water will bead right off of it. So... I've got all that stuff on my car and I could not, I genuinely, this is not, a, not an advertisement, I genuinely could not be happier about it. My car is five, over five years old now and it still looks new, which I am very grateful to Immaculate Reflections for because they're the reason, they're the reason it, it looks so good. So again, check them out, irdetailing.com. 
If you reach out to book in an appointment through there, just mention that you're a Ride the Lightning listener and you will be extended the Ride the Lightning listener discount, which is a really nice thing that they do. PureTesla.com slash RTL. Head on over there if you need a good, long-term, reliable dash cam and sentry mode setup. It uses micro USD, micro SD, oh my goodness. Uh, clearly it's getting late and I need to go to bed. Uh, micro SD based storage there, even though it does plug in into your car's USB port that the car has natively in it. But uh, it is going to be the long term most reliable way to go because micro SD is just built as a memory storage format. It's built for the constant reading and writing that the dash cam and sentry mode do. So you can either get the 128 gigabyte version for $49 or the $69 256 gigabyte version. Either way, they ship free anywhere in the US, which is nice. If you're outside of the US, you can still order. It'll just cost you a a modest shipping fee to send it internationally. And finally, I will mention my Patreon, which again, you can find at patreon.com slash Tesla podcast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And that is the primary way through which you can voluntarily choose to support me with Ride the Lightning. If you really enjoy the podcast, you've been listening to it for a while, my hope is that at some point you'll hear this part of the show and go, you know what? Yes, Ryan, I really appreciate what you do week in and week out every single Sunday So I'm going to back you on Patreon. I'd be so grateful if you saw it in your heart to do that. Again, you can head over to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast to find all the information to actually put forth a pledge. There is an annual pledge option in addition to the monthly option. And if you do go with the annual where you're supporting for 12 months and you just pay once, there's a 10% discount by doing it that way. So that's a nice thing to take advantage of if, if that is appealing to you. The, as I said at the top, the base tier is just five bucks a month, five bucks a month, and you can be supporting what I do here at Ride the Lightning. And in return, you will get not only the, I hope, satisfaction and happiness of supporting something that you enjoy, but you'll get early access to each week's episode. In this week's case, you'd get extra early access to it. And then if you step up to that $10 a month tier, you'll get the early access each week and those weekly lightning round bonus mini episodes and the previous 67 that I've already done. The support tiers do continue up from there if you're feeling extra generous. Uh, the we, the monthly Patreon Zoom Hangout uh, is always a blast. That's for the folks at the maximum plaid tier, that's that $25 per month tier. So they get all the perks plus that monthly call that we have so much fun on. Anyway, head on over to patreon.com slash Tesla podcast if you would be so kind. You can listen to this podcast on pretty much all the major podcast services. Most people seem to get it on Apple Podcasts, but it's also on Google Podcasts on TuneIn, on Spotify, on YouTube podcasts. And by the way, if you do want to find me on YouTube, I'm just at, just search on YouTube, Ride the Lightning Tesla, and that should take you to my channel pretty easily. The, uh, again, there's pretty much no video on my YouTube channel, uh, with the occasional exception, like my Cybertruck test ride from the back seat four years ago, like that video's up there. But it is an it is an audio syndication platform. And now that YouTube does formally does YouTube podcasts, it's in there's that as well. So if that's how you want to listen to it, please by all means go for it. Uh, use somebody's referral code if you're gonna buy a Tesla. Preferably not mine. Hopefully you can find somebody else in your life that's got one so that you can both benefit from the perks of the of the referral link. But If you just need one, if you're buying a new Tesla and you just need a link, you are welcome to use mine. Just type in into your web browser, ts.la slash Ryan73014. Hit enter or return. I don't know. Some people are return people. Some people are enter people. My keyboard is an enter keyboard. 
I don't know if it's a Mac PC thing. Anyway, that doesn't matter. That's how you can use my referral link if you need one. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, you can follow me on X and or on Instagram. I have the same handle on both, which is DMC underscore Ryan. My podcast email address is teslapodcast at gmail.com. And finally, I want to say hello and thank you to the upper tier Patreon backers, the extra generous folks. I will start with the Roadster in Space tier backers. I have one-on-one calls with two of them this weekend, which I'm very much looking forward to. Those folks are Pete White, Lyle Austin, Steve Radspinner, Fernando Cordero, Lawton from Chicago, Sean Neidig, Neil Weaver, Jackson Wallace, Rolf and Jennifer Evers, Howard Anthony Smith, who's one of the folks I'll be chatting with this weekend, Victoria Iacoveto, Tesla Hitchhiker 42, the other person that I'm looking forward to chatting with this weekend, Kara Weston, Robert from New, uh, near Philly, pardon me, and the newest Roadster in Space tier backer. Big thank you to Kristen Rumble. Thank you so much for your generosity, Kristen. She sent me a very, very nice note, which, which honestly made my day. I will also thank and shout out the Maximum Plaid backers. They are Jonathan Wales, Cameron Clark, Daniel Grummer, Seth Capello, Nick and Tony, the Galpin family, Ryan from New York City, Darren Nickel, Kaz Barnes, Brett Libano, Patrick Wisneski, Gil Cabrera, Watley, Mark Eversole, Todd Badger, Joe Edgel, Kevin Yank, the Tesla Owners Club of San Joaquin Valley, Michael Williams, Will Stedman, Derek Nessel wrote, Justin Perez, Jeremy Harris, Chris Beach, Tom Mills, Corey O'Donnell, Aaron, John Cody, Joel Sapp, Paul Casarino, Richard Corley, Chris Osborne, KB, Ken Epstein, Doug Carey, James Gregory, Adam Lavoy, contact1callcenter.com, Jason Chalukas, Travis Krenzel, Bruce Otterstein, Tom Behan, Josh Pennington, Matt Kalen, John from Cream Ridge, pardon me, John, John from Cream Ridge, New Jersey, my home state, Sean Tisdale, Dustin Hart, and Michael Gallo. And finally, a hello and a thank you to the grandfathered in plaid level supporters who are George Cassiopo, David Brander, Logan Willis, Peter Chalet, Eric Randolph, Dory and Steve Guberman, the Tesla owners of Taiwan, Ron Lee, Charlie Gillespie, David Perella, Dennis Peake, Jeff Angwin, Chase Cabanillas, the Lydia family, Aaron Altschul, Jared Brown, Jerome Strack, Jamie Dalton, the Tesla owners East Bay Club, Mike and Barbara from Louisville, David J. Howes, Matt Nixon, the Tesla Owners Club of Wisconsin, Ish, not Elon Musk, Peter, and the Bear Boys of Colorado. Thank you all so much at all levels of the Patreon for very kindly and generously supporting what I do here week in and week out on Ride the Lightning. Well, this has been, as expected, an extra long episode, although, not, I mean, not totally unexpected, but so joyous nevertheless, we got the date for the Cybertruck delivery event. I can't wait. Like I said, I have uh, optimistically booked flights, although I've made them refundable just in case I'm not able to, to get there, not able to get an invitation. But fingers crossed, toes crossed, that I'm able to go. I hope some of you are able to get there as well. And if so, I hope that I'm also there and that we can meet face to face and we can we can uh, enjoy that evening together and celebrate the the launch of this this insane idea that Tesla had several years ago and has followed through on and built something unlike anyone in the history of the automotive world has ever done. I mean, think about it. It's true. That is not an exaggeration to say that. Yes, it fits into the full-size pickup truck class, but it is a vehicle unlike any other that has ever existed. And you know what? That's one thing. It's I always thought of the DeLorean that way too. That it's now in the DeLorean's case, it was never the fastest car. 
It, it's, you know, it's the DeLorean. It, I wouldn't sit here even as much as it means to me. It's not the best car in the world, but it is so historically unique for a number of reasons. And the Cybertruck, I think it's fair to say, shares that description as well, along with sharing the stainless steel body. All right, my friends, that is the end of Ride the Lightning episode 429. Happy electric motoring, and I will see you back here next week. I mean, I think a Tesla is the most fun thing you could possibly buy ever. That's what it's meant to be. Our goal is to make... It's, it's not exactly a car. It's actually a thing to maximize enjoyment. It's maximum fun.